Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in from wherever you've uh, travelled to be with us tonight for a very special event. We're really pleased to have two of the best writers, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I can say that rather than just poets, just poets, because uh, Amanda Dalton is an award-winning playwright, uh, particularly well known for her work on radio. And indeed the poem that she's going to read tonight, the two long poems that make up one collection uh, was recently uh, broadcast on Radio 3 and uh, was got a big splash in the Radio Times. And Kim Moore, as you know, uh, Kim's uh, latest collection is this rather handsome and rather remarkable book uh, from Saren, uh, All the Men I Never Married. But she's going to be reading tonight for, from some prose. Uh, so both, as you know, uh, will have to endure my introductions. I'm going to uh, introduce Kim first. They'll both read for about 20 minutes. At the end of it, if you can, I know that Susanna is um, in charge of questions. So we're hoping that lots of you will come up with questions. Uh, the best question wins an imaginary prize. So do uh, think of putting them in uh, to Susanna. And I know that there is a special uh, way of buying the book, the books. Um, so without more ado, I'm going to uh, say some things about Kim. Uh, we were delighted when she came to us with the idea of a pamphlet uh, uh, for a book about the trumpet. She, as most of you know, I guess that uh, she was for, she trained, she studied music and was a trumpet teacher for several years. And then this uh, pamphlet turned into this really lovely book, um, What the Trumpet Taught Me uh, over time, quite quickly, I think. Uh, Kim is, has won uh, the J. Jeffrey Faber Memorial Prize, a new Writing North Award, an Eric Gregory Award. It's quicker to say what she hasn't won. Uh, she's still a few years off the Nobel. Uh, her first pamphlet, you'll want to know this, is still available. It's called If We Could Speak Like Wolves and was a winner in the Poetry Business Pamphlet Competition judged by Caroline Duffy. Uh, it was then shortlisted for the Michael Marks Award and won Lakeland Book of the Year. Anyway, um, I want you, uh, if you will, to... Um, Think of some questions as uh, Kim reads from this rather remarkable book, What the Trumpet Taught Me. Hi, thank you, Peter. Thanks so much for the, for the introduction. Um, and hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be, to be here and reading with Amanda Dalton. Um, and I know my mum and dad are in the in the YouTube audience, um, I guilt tripped them again today because I should have actually met Amanda Dalton when I was eleven because she was the deputy head teacher at my local school. But instead, we went to a different school for various reasons. And um, but eventually, I got to meet her when I it was in my twenties. So it was fate. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to be to be reading with Amanda. Um, so I'm just going to read some little bits from this from this um, strange little trumpet book, which is I call it a lyric essay. Um, I thought, what's less marketable than poetry? I know a lyric essay, um, which a lot of people don't really know what they are or pretend not to. But um, so it, I, I it's a I call it a lyric essay because it's kind of a memoir crossed with um, research about the trumpet, crossed with poetry crossed with essay writing. Um, a lyric essay basically allows me to do whatever I want. Um, so I'm just gonna read some sections of it. Um, okay. I'm 10 years old when my teacher asks the class who would like to play a brass instrument. Because I'm the sort of child who volunteers for everything, my hand shoots into the air. And though I believe I'm never chosen, this time my teacher picks me along with my twin sister and two other children in the class. I don't even know what a brass instrument is, but I know I want to be chosen. In our school, everyone knows what recorders and violins are. We have a school orchestra led by a teacher called Mrs M. If you show promise on the recorder, 
Eventually, Mrs. M invites you to change to the violin. Mrs. M writes letters above the stave for the above the writes letters above the musical notes for the recorders, but the violin players have to learn to read music. When she offers me the violin, I refuse. I know the violin sounds terrible. I blame the instrument rather than the children wielding the bow. Mrs. M has short dark hair and huge spectacles. She writes out parts so we can accompany the whole school in hymn practice. Every morning we line up in front of the piano to practice together. Mrs. M's voice is harsh and nasal. She can cut through 20 squeaking recorders and out of tune violins without even standing up from her piano stool. We play as the rest of the school sing along using books held together with tape along the spines. Hymns like When a Knight on His Spurs, my favorite because the words feel like a poem or he's got the whole world in his hands, which I hated because it was repetitive and dull. Um, so we got given a brass instrument at school to try out. And obviously the brass teacher, I say we, me and my twin sister, obviously the teacher cottoned on pretty quickly that we wouldn't have been able to afford to buy one. So he sent us along to a, a brass band. Um, and still in those days, you just turn up and you got a free instrument. Um, and that still happens now, or you pay like very minimal subs, like 50p a week or something. And um, this next extract is, or this next section, um, is tells the, the story of the first time I heard a proper brass band. So I'd been going to this junior band for a while, and then I stayed behind um, to listen to a proper brass band. I stayed behind after junior band rehearsal to listen to the senior band. They play the theme tune to Rocky. I don't know it's the theme tune to Rocky. I think it's the most profound and beautiful thing I've ever heard. I have goosebumps on my arms, although it's not the staccato fanfare of the cornets at the beginning, but the entrance of the lower brass that makes my heart lurch. At some point in the piece, it feels like the music turns. It's at this point I understand what yearning means, although I don't have a name for it, this feeling, this longing. Later, I understand this was a key change, but this is 1992. I'm 11 years old and falling in love. Um, so I should have explained as well, the book's made up of like short prose sections. So they look like little prose poems, but um, I definitely think of them as, as prose, not prose poems. Um, and I'm just gonna read two little sections um, next to kind of give you a, an idea of what it was like, or what it was like for me anyway, being in this in this um, brass band, which I was basically obsessed with from the age of about 10 to 16, 17. And every year playing hymns in Victoria Park at the Cenotaph, learning the last post by heart, standing in band uniform and no extra coats allowed and just thin black shoes, and the girls must wear skirts and no woolly hats when you play. It's not part of the uniform, though gloves, black, are allowed. Rock on your heels if your feet are tired or cold. Don't look bored. The rhythm of the service running through you. Not just the hymns, the cannon firing and the birds scattering into the sky, but also the words. They shall not grow old as we who are left grow old. November circling around again, and always grey, and always cold, and thinking, you'll be part of this every year of your life. The open fifth, the call unanswered. And every year in December, playing Christmas carols under lampposts, learning each carol by heart so I don't need to take my gloves off to turn the page falling in love with my own sound on an empty street, noticing vibrato for the first time, but never asking what it is, only taking it in, letting it into my body. We stand in a circle to play, shoulder to shoulder. Our parents go from house to house with collection tins. Sometimes I turn away and play into the darkness, into the night. Sometimes it's icy and we must walk carefully the instrument protected at all costs. I fall over and manage to keep my cornet held aloft in the air. Everybody cheers. Um, 
And although my, my mom and dad couldn't afford to buy an instrument, so we had an instrument from the band for, for many, many years, um, they did support us in lots of other ways. Um, and I just realised, you know, there's, a, there's another bit, you know, every year we did go Christmas caroling and my poor mum and dad went, all the parents kind of knocked on people's doors and collected money for the, for the band. Um, and this is another kind of um, example of that. My dad is transposing a duet so my sister and I can play together. Me on my cornet, her on, her on the tenor horn. He's counting ledger lines, transposing by numbers because he never learnt to read music. He's writing the parts out carefully by hand, first with pencil, and then he'll go over them with a black pen. I'll be careless with these parts. I'll crease them, rip them by mistake, make them unreadable in various ways and ask him to write them out again. Or my sister will leave them somewhere or lend them to somebody and forget who, or not bother to ask for their return. My dad's leaning on a road atlas, using a ruler with scaffold services written across it. He's making sure the stem of every note is straight, ensuring none of the bar lines lean one way or the other. Um, and I don't know, I think Sue's, Sue's put the link to the, um, the document if people want to have a look at the, at the book, but um, we worked with this amazing artist that Peter and Anne found called um, Emma Burley. And I told her that when I was 17, I wanted to have a, a trumpet tattooed to my stomach. And I, I drew one <laughs> in this um, and sent it to her. Can you imagine? It's like, um, I don't know building a really rubbish house of Lego in front of, in front of an architect or something. Um, anyway, and she created these amazing little, let's see if, I, if you can see it, these amazing little trumpets. So originally, originally I had um, numbers separating the parts and now I've got little line drawings of trumpets and cornets. Um, so that was like kind of a bit of, a lot of that's like straight memoir, but then, um, which is how the, the book started. I sent this very personal kind of essay to Peter and Anne. And um, Peter just um, said, just keep writing, it's not finished yet. And um, that was a really kind of important, um, useful thing for someone, someone to say. Um, and that kind of gave me permission to keep going with it. And I started doing a lot more research into the kind of the history of the trumpet and um, to, into famous trumpet players. Um, and this is one of those, one of those, um, the next two, the next three pieces are about one of those stories that I found out about the oldest trumpets in the world. The oldest trumpets in the world were discovered in King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 by British archeologist, Howard Carter. One of the trumpets was made of silver, the other of bronze. When they were found, they'd not been played for 3,000 years. I imagine picking the silver trumpet up, how light it would be, like a hollow branch. I imagine balancing the weight of it in my hand, of the journey towards the mouth, of filling it with breath for the first time in centuries. In 1939, British bandsman Jack James Tappan was chosen to play the trumpets found in King Tutankhamun's tomb, live on BBC radio. In the recording, he blows three notes. I can hear how he's riding each one, straining to keep control of it, to find his way around the instrument. Of course, that's not the whole story. The first attempt to play the trumpets ended in disaster. A bandsman from the Egyptian army was originally chosen for the task and valiantly tried to wring more than a single pitch from the silver trumpet with no success. He then decided to use a modern bugle mouthpiece. The stories of what happened next vary, but I'm shocked when I read one account that the nameless bandsman, because the bugle mouthpiece did not fit properly, smacked it with the palm of his hand further into the trumpet. The silver trumpet shattered into fragments and the bandsman was left holding only the stem. Alfred Lucas, a member of Howard Carter's archaeological team, was hospitalized with shock. Even more extraordinarily, King Farouk, the King of Egypt, happened to be touring the Cairo Museum and entered the room just as the trumpet shattered. The king then got down on his hands and knees to help gather up the precious shards of silver. Um, <clears throat> 
The legend is that King Tutankhamun's trumpets call conflict into being, that they are cursed. As evidence, the start of World War II, only a few months after they were first played, live on the BBC from Cairo. See also the sounding of the silver trumpet just prior to the six day war between Egypt and Israel in 1967. See also the Gulf War, which broke out in 1990, shortly after the silver trumpet was blown. See also the silver trumpet blown in 2011 and followed swiftly by the Egyptian revolution. Apparently it was a cleaner at the museum that blew it, blew the trumpet in 2011 and caused the Egyptian revolution. Um, I'm just gonna uh, play, after telling you that the oldest, the, these trumpets are cursed and you're not meant to blow them, I'm gonna play the BBC recording because it's so amazing. Um, but if you are of a superstitious um, disposition, you might wanna mute for the next minute. Uh, here we go. I cut the silver trumpet off in its prime then. But um, I just think that's the most amazing, weird, unearthly sound. It's feel, it sounds to me like it's just coming from another another world. And it is, you know, that was the first time it had been, it had been played in, in 3000 years. Um, and if, you're, if you want to, there's a great video on, the, on YouTube. If you just Google BBC oldest trumpets in the world, you'll find the full video and some more information about it. So um, you might be wondering, I've mentioned the word cornet quite a few times, and um, you might be thinking, um, why is the book about trumpets when I'm going on about cornets? Um, I basically started on the cornet because that's what you play in brass bands. And then um, I got a new teacher when I went to do A-level music and he was a trumpet player and um, persuaded me to swap to trumpet because they're a lot more flexible. There's a lot more ens different ensembles that you can play in. But the problem is with trumpets and orchestral instruments is there isn't the same system in place as there is with brass bands. So I had to save up to buy a trumpet and I needed a professional standard one to go to music college. Um, but I just wanted to share one more thing, which is um, a little picture to show you the difference between um, the trumpet and the cornet. There you go, you should be able to see that now. So that's, that's the cornet there and that's the trumpet just in case you're wondering. Um, and I apologize if I'm patronizing people and they know already. Okay, so this is a little bit about that kind of saving up for a trumpet. I have less than a year to save up enough money to buy my own trumpet. I draw a trumpet across four pages that I tape carefully together. I divide the trumpet into 1800 small squares, which is what a Vincent Bach Stradivarius with a 43 inch bell and reverse tuning slide will cost. There's no question of asking my mum and dad for the money. I know they can't afford it. I get a new job, selling double glazing over the phone. My A-level teacher says I should be spending my time practising and studying, not working dead-end jobs. I don't tell her that most of my family do jobs like this, in factories, on scaffolding sites, plastering walls or cutting hair serving dinners in junior schools or caring for the elderly in the daytime and then supplementing their wages with bar work in the evening. At my new job, every time I make an appointment over the phone for a salesman to call around and give a quote for new doors or windows, I get an extra £10 on top of my hourly minimum wage rate. If I make three appointments in one week, I get a £100 bonus. If the salesman sells anything, 
I get 10% of the total for making the appointment. In my first week, I earn 800 pounds. Every time I earn any money, I color in the little squares. I'm in a race against time. I have to earn enough money to buy a trumpet before I leave for university so I can give my teacher his instrument back. But I'm also in a race against my teacher's trumpet, which is slowly falling apart. Both water keys are held together by elastic bands and every now and again they come loose. The valves are temperamental and often stick, no matter how much I clean them. But more worryingly, the metal is thin in places, as thin as paper. I could make a hole in it with a finger if I tried. So the, throughout the book, there's lots of lost trumpets. Um, there's the one, one of the Egyptian, the bronze trumpet um, that was found in King Tut's tomb was stolen during the Egyptian revolution. Um, and this next bit tells the story of when I also lost my trumpet, um, which I never found again after saving up for it. I lost it a week after going to music college. You could say this happened because of the man who danced like Mick Jagger. We leave his house together in the morning and catch a bus into town. The trumpet is with me when I leave and then suddenly disappears. You could say this happened because I was hungover or because I was tired. You could say I lost the trumpet because I was in love, because I was concentrating only on him, because I was not really there on the bus with the man who danced like Mick Jagger. The trumpet perched where? Between my legs? In the luggage space? I can't remember. I was already moving into our future, into the moment of parting, walking backwards. I was young. I couldn't take my eyes from him. I claim on my insurance and get another trumpet, exactly the same as the first, a shadow brother of the one I saved up for. And then um, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit to um, this is from uh, I haven't. This is from uh, the note card found um, that. Sorry, it's it's. I've got it from a note card made by Howard Carter's team, which documents exactly how they found you know every single item that was found in the the tomb. They had to keep a record of it, obviously, and describe um, what they found. And I thought I would read this one because. Um, it just kind of gives an example of borrowing from poetry. It's one of the ones that I think of that's closer to poetry maybe than prose. A silver trumpet wrapped in reeds. No, try again. A silver trumpet embellished in gold and wrapped in reeds. No, try again. A silver trumpet found in the southeast corner of the tomb, wrapped in reeds. No, try again. A silver trumpet lying under a calcite lamp, wrapped in reeds, the southeast corner of the tomb. No, try again. A silver trumpet engraved with a wall of sepals and calluses to represent the lotus flower, embellished in gold, wrapped in reeds, the southeast corner of the tomb. No. A silver trumpet wrapped in reeds. Inside the trumpet, a wooden core to prevent it being squashed. No. A silver trumpet found with a red pottery stopper with blue decoration, the ribs of an ox, a broken wooden label with no inscription, a fragment of pot containing a black substance, almost. And I think that's, that's me. Thank you so much for, for listening. That was remarkable, Kim. It, it, it's a unique book, I think. And because you are a poet, um, you've had this experience that you've managed to make available to others. It's a really wonderful book. And uh, it just so happens we do have copies for sale. But it's really, thank you very much for that smashing reading. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to embarrass, uh, to introduce uh, Amanda Dalton. Uh, when, 
Amanda sent, she sent the, the, the poems, there are two long poems, uh, to Anne Sanson, first of all, uh, not uh, just to share them with Anne. Um, um, they were important to Amanda we, and, uh, and she wanted Anne's, Anne to read them. Uh, and immediately uh, Anne saw that they, they were extraordinary and uh, then they, they must be published. So that's where it all started. Uh, I'm hoping that Amanda's going to join us on screen. So, and uh, I'll just say some things that have been said about you um, <laughs> and say that uh, as well as the, the, the plays, the adaptations for Radio 3 and Radio 4 and, and the um, original work that you've been doing, uh, you have two full length collections from Blood Axe and a third one is on its way. When, when about do you think it's likely to be? Who knows? 23, <laughs> maybe 24. Yeah. Right. I'm slow. I'm slow. Slow but sure. No, slow but extraordinary. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jackie Kay says that you're going to read both poems. They, they turn over, don't they? It's an extraordinary, um, very nice. I think it was Katie's idea to, to put the book um, Katie's our, our designer and um, she did she did everything on the book really and it's a really beautiful I don't think she'll mind me mind us saying that it really is a beautiful production and um, but it turns over halfway through so to give the poems equal weight one doesn't follow the other one but you're not going to read them simultaneously you and um, Jackie Kay said of it, this is a poem that Jackie said, it's three lines, haunting, elegiac, engrossing, and ultimately energizing, affecting and philosophical. Notes on water will make you think about water in a million ways, the way water sings, the way it threatens and heals. Uh, the other thing that we noticed was that, if you don't mind me saying, that they're, they're the work of a remarkable poet writing in the darkest of times with urgency and grace. So uh, please, um, we'll welcome Amanda Dalton. Thank you, Peter, thank you. Well, um, before I read, I, there's a couple of things I, just to say. First of all, a Kim Moore thing. I haven't had a chance to say this to Kim, but we talk about six degrees of separation. Kim talked about how I was nearly the deputy head of <laughs> as a pupil thank god i escaped that imagine um it's also the case that in the second world war my dad was in cairo and actually did a kind of it ain't half hot mum style performance for at king farouk's palace for king farouk and he was in fact working for bbc broadcasting for the for the for the war service so it, there's a small chance that there's a connection with that trumpet um anyway that aside um thanks kim for that fabulous reading and I do really re recommend this book it, 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 read it in its entirety and it, it works as an extraordinary memoir of a part of Kim's life as well as a an homage to brass instruments notes on water um yeah it's not very cheerful I'm afraid I began writing it um in writing a, a long poem really about water and I live in a part of the world that's very watery and where there's been a lot of flooding. And so I was thinking water. Um, and then my, my partner fell ill and, and very quickly died. And it became a poem about grief. It became a poem, a broader poem. It's not, I don't think it's just about him or about, or about floods. It's about loss um, in its many guises, I guess. So I'm afraid it's not very funny. It's not got many jokes. I think I need to tell some jokes or something in the middle. I'm gonna read, um, I'm gonna read it straight through, which uh, you might need to, I don't know, put a bag on your head or have a gin or something, cause it's, it's, it goes on a bit. Um, it's actually, uh, it, it actually does do this beautiful thing in the middle though, of having these, these, uh, these black and white prints and just to tell you what they actually are because nobody would really know this uh, it references the poem references um some places in scotland um and actually these are all genuine photographs although they were in color that i took in my attempts to capture images of dolphins uh swimming beside a boat that i was on with my partner david um, and i managed to take 40 photographs 
of the dolphins swimming by the boat who were close enough to touch and didn't get a single dolphin in a single photograph, um, which made me laugh at the time, but they felt like a kind of suitable thing to have in the middle of the, the pamphlet to show that the division between the poems really. So I'm gonna take a slip of water and then I'm just gonna read. And thanks, thanks for being here, everybody. <clears throat> Notes on water. I'm swimming in an artificial pool inside a broken building. The water is deep and brown and full of wreckage. A floated rusting can, papers swelling as they soak. I'm out of my depth, weak breaststroke turning to doggy paddle an ache in the shoulders and hips. A pink balloon taps my face, a flotilla of paper party cups, nothing that will make a raft. Beyond the water, flaked plaster, smashed windows, wires hang from the walls. My sister is kneeling in the rubble. She has no idea how close I am to drowning. Because of what happened, he said, when I think of rivers, I can only remember the current strength, how I never really reckoned with its power. The water was opaque. I had no idea which way was up, she said, or down. At 3 a.m. I wake, thinking of the man who will leave in winter. My gut is tight, my head white noise, I'm dry. I feel my way downstairs, fill the kettle in the dark, not ready for electric light. The water's force surprises me, splashing the tiles, soaking my arm. My feet ache on the slabs, and I wonder how anyone bears the cold of swimming a freezing river. The going in, the shock on the belly, the whole body gasping. I want to try it. I want to see if it stops my heart or snaps me wide awake. Stones in her pockets. I haven't read her books, but I know she drowned. Today, there's a smiling boy in the car park, little Noah, pouring rivers from a watering can. He calls me out to see how his streams gather speed as they make their way down the sloping tarmac, forking as they catch on grit. He starts another and another, wills them to connect, thrills when they do. I refill can after can and join him, building settlements of broken stone. Some become islands, some are flooded, some survive the bursting riverbanks. He builds a shop and we plan to make the island as a boat. But Ben is driving away in a van and he can't help it. He's flattening the houses. Everything is smeared and rerouted when he's gone. By lunchtime, all roads in and out were blocked and I realized we were cut off completely. I'm seven on a beach in Wales, crying as the tide stalks my mountain range of sand, its rivulets of seawater, its waterfalls. The valley town at its base with a river, farmstead, fields. Dad said it would be prone to flooding, and it is. I rescue my plastic animals, leave the world to drown. It wasn't drowned, they said, it was flooded. Drown's a soft word, nothing soft in this except for the stinking mud. The colder, colder and hebbed in water all in town. I hate that river. Which one? The one that was in my house. The one that made the whole town one big filthy river, floating cars on Albert Street. St George's Square, an artificial lake, a drunken slap on a cheek, and the soaking books in supermarket trolleys, toxic slime on shovels, shoes, between the floorboards, up the walls the drenched and the nowhere to go and the lost a lot. And don't say it's almost beautiful the way the burst banks remade the woods. 
Don't say that a flooded cinema's romantic. So many carpets on the pavements, so many fridges, sofas, Christmas trees. Open the door and the halls in the cellar. Open the door and the TV's caked in slime. There's a man in tears in the road with his dog on his shoulders, looking at his half-submerged front door. Next day, the fucking sightseers blocking the streets. Next day, the water sings. I walk the bank with someone else's dog on a lead, and it's like the river saying, yes, an ordinary day, nothing doing here. I watch a wagtail wagging stone to stone. Even the living statue herons there, powdered grey. And I asked the dog if we should give it a coin for its trouble. There's a sycamore down and some branches on the path, but nothing like the fallen army ripped apart that day in Ardnamurchan, that defeated battlefield of trees, enough to make you weep. Then the dog says, flow. And I say, fucking hippie dog. And the river says, I'm thinking of the man who will leave in winter. I am thinking of David Nash's wooden boulder, that great ball of oak slipping downstream, stuttering for months, coming to rest in the estuary until the heavy rains, high tides, dislodge it again and again, and it's gone. I am thinking of David Nash, gently searching for years, how he said, it hasn't vanished, I just can't see it. And the dog says, that'll do, think that. Hasn't disappeared, you just can't see it. On the far side of the artificial pool, my sister is kneeling in the rubble, talking to an empty window frame, talking to the wire that hangs from the wall, telling the tale of a woman who walked her dog beside a river that was fast and high. The dog jumped in, my sister tells the window frame, was swept away. The woman followed the river for miles, running and driving and shouting for strangers to help her search for the dog, but no one found it, ever. Lighten up, I say to my sister, mouth full of rusty water, grasping a paper party cup, a pink balloon. I remember walking and driving near the River Wye, he said, never quite knowing where it would turn up next. I love that the stream by my house, she said, runs to the Calder, which joins the Ooze, which passes my brother's, becomes the Humber, which goes by my mum and dad's. Never mind that saying, he said, that saying, you can't step into the same river twice. If I follow the river at its rate of travel, the water I sample at the confluence might include the water I sampled at the source. I'm beside it, drinking beer. I'm beside it, drinking beer, the river, sunlight popping, rocks gargling, even the knot of flies at the bridge is beautiful. I want to jump into the water, feel its liquid rush. But I'm busy looking at maps to calculate how long it would take for this particular stretch to reach the man who will leave in winter. And the answer is forever, or more brutally is never. The colder joins the air at Castleford, flows to the start of the Humber, useless. Derwent joined by the Wyatt Rousley, stop. This is stupid, pointless, childish, rather difficult. Drink beer, drift. No, no, she said, it's not the meandering drift. What I love about rivers is systems. That's in capital letters because it matters. Rivers are the circulation system of the land. There's an iPad on the floor of the broken building. A YouTube man is teaching my sister to dance. Start with your right foot, he says, in front of your left. We're going to hop on our left foot and then place down our right. Hop, one, pick up the left foot and he's hopping. Place it down for two, two, pick up the right in front. 
and my sister is up on her feet, stepping and hopping and laughing, and I laugh too, and whatever she's doing looks nothing like a river dance. Then this, this, before I have said goodbye to the man who will leave in winter, before I can write of the tall church spire that protrudes from the lake in a drought, before I remember the water diviner who found the line of liquid pure and running white beneath the old school hall, this, how to describe it, a fault line that appeared in the ground in an instant, patterned not unlike a riverbed and running fast as Noah's little rivers, veining, widening, but dry as a bone. A breach, rubble falling down the gaps, a crack that might have been a gunshot, fog of dust from walls that crumble silently. I thought of the hotel that fell into the sea, of the crockery and napkin rings still buried in the hill, the floating coat hangers, the reading spectacles a guest forgot to pack in his haste. I thought of the terrific speed of the fall. And as the pool fractured and the water drained away, I thought of the stupid times I'd stayed in the bath after pulling the plug the heaviness in the limbs, the little shiver, and I lay on stone with the paper cups and the pink balloon, my gut tight, head white, noise dry. And I knew I must go deeper, close my eyes and drop through the cleft. I knew I must find a river in the dark. Hans was not mistaken, he said, in journey to the center of the earth. What you hear is a rushing of a torrent. A torrent? There can be no doubt. A subterranean river flows around us. The water's force surprises me. I go deep into it, wear it, feel the weight lighten me. I think I am in the river Cocytus. Or maybe this is just black water running underneath an urban street. Somewhere far above my sister kneels, drawing symbols in the dust. And the man who will leave in winter slowly walks, a forked twig in his hands. He knows what it takes to daylight a river that runs underground. I know he is dowsing for me. Soon he will find a stream and follow it, but stop, this is pointless. Some rivers never meet. He reaches the sea. Down here is Jackdaw Black, blacker than Blackout, blacker than Vanta Black. And I am a cave fish, accidental troglomorph, with nothing but a raft of papers breaking down in the wet. I circle counterclockwise, swim until the fragments of my skull change shape and I'm asymmetrical, losing color, and my eyes are weak. Time slows in the black, folds in on itself and disappears. Or perhaps it's only time that's moving me. I navigate by touch, I barely eat, but still I feel these fins grow large. And though I can't see a thing through these useless eyes, they open and I wake. Notes on water. <clears throat> In a small terraced house, a woman waits through a long night. She boils a kettle, washes cups, palms three tangerines to see if she remembers how to juggle. The living room's reflected in the yard. A sideboard hovers on the tiny pond. Her piano juts across the lane. She's out there too, standing in the hedge. Wonders, is it her ghost that waits inside? Upstairs, he lies soaked in pain, but still the doctor doesn't come. 
2 a.m., 4.30, 5.15. She phones again. A busy night, they say. They're on their way. She goes upstairs to sit with him. But it's easier to look at a photograph, the one she'll decide to frame when he dies. He's on a boat, all smiles, binoculars around his neck, everything blue and calm and bright. That was the day they saw the dolphins, who surfaced, laughing, glided beside them close enough to touch. A day of unexpected highland sun, a kind of happiness. Was it there even then? The start of a mass in his gut, a stain? Did he feel dis-ease as it pooled in his blood? Or was it later on Ardnamurchan, driving through pouring rain, the day he slipped and fell in a storm of magnolia, blossoms strewn like confetti on the muddy bank, the day the deluge blocked the well and she searched for buckets, found the brook, the bottled water, laughed because this really didn't matter, then saw how he couldn't cope anymore. Later, she'd walked alone by the sea lock, felt the slow drip of loss. She wonders, was that why she made a list of everything she saw to give to him, to keep something from seeping away? Bladderwood, she wrote, white driftwood, flowers that might be Meadow Cranesbill, bits of wood. She couldn't stop. A tenant's lager can, marsh marigold in clumps, eight oyster catches, 14 adult sheep, nine lambs, a broken rowing boat, a pair of dark coloured ducks with six young, a crow, ringed plovers, five, red plastic, might be from a child's spade, dead crab, a herring gull, sheep's wool, the remains of a fire, four black-headed gulls, a plastic shoe, green, campion, plastic bottles, three, seawort, marum grass, a length of rusted metal chain, thousands of stones, two plastic bags, some shells, a rock, an orange rope, moss, gorse, wet grass, muddy, rock samphire, blue plastic piping, a broken pint glass, partly buried, sudden gathering of terns, a lot of seaweed, mainly knotted rack and kelp, gritty sand, a gang of Canada geese unexpected round a bend. And she took photographs for him. The wader she couldn't identify, the perfect reflection of a sheep, the evening light on the loch after rain, the view from the opposite shore. And she saw how they didn't interest him, how they all looked the same. These days, she can't bear the sting of the shower, so she lies in the bath for hours, lets water out, refreshes it with hot until she scalds. She thinks of how the wetness makes her fingers look like his, the puckered contours, knuckles pouched. But when she touches her thumb to her middle finger, she hears a squelch, liquid moving under her flesh. And she wonders how half his body is water, even now as he desiccates. In just seven weeks, he goes from coffee and wine to peppermint tea, to tiny fruits, to water on a spoon, to this, the last of the nights and days when she holds his parched hand, moistens his lips with balm, cups a tiny glass to him, but he chokes on a sip. And the beautiful nurse says, just a drop on the tongue like this. And when he opens his mouth for her fingertip, he's a fledgling. His feet are cold, but he can't bear the duvet, even a sheet, and so she looks for socks and finds the swimming shorts he never wore and never will. After he dies, she can't quite part with them. He always said he hated swimming. Still, he would dive into pools. And she remembers the violence of his splash, the wild front crawl, the way he shot underwater up and out in a single breath. Months after he dies, she washes his clothes by hand, has no idea why. Thinks perhaps she'd wanted to bathe his body before they took it away. Or is this a kind of saying goodbye to the smell of him, to his skin, making sure he's no longer there before she parts with him? 
She hangs trousers, jumpers, jackets, shirts on radiators, over rails from the tops of doors, until everywhere she turns, she sees him all at once on different days. Him in a Pennine snowstorm, him in the blazing heat of southern Spain. He stands behind her, beside her, in front of a bookshelf, suddenly there up close, and she wants to bury her head in his damp blue shirt, but there's no chest or shoulder and his arms are limp, and she can't tell is she taunted by the way that everything hangs in his shape those weeks before he died, so thin, too weak for an embrace, and she's overwhelmed by his presence and by the absence of him. A restless night, a storm, the threat of flood. At 8 a.m., the ghostly wail of the siren, and by midday streets are flowing, steep roads surge, everything is river, and the river is more than itself, carrying vehicles on its back, a fallen tree, trying to drag its feet to calm the rage, but it's too headstrong, churning silt and gravel, spewing up a pushchair, plastic shoe, dead jack door, bin, everything is brown and broken, everything is wet. She's out with the rest of the town in wellies, rubber gloves, remembering the last flood, how he'd cursed his lack of strength to bail and lift, how he'd driven instead, delivered food to homes that were drowned. And she knows she should be glad he isn't seeing this. Next day, she walks the woods, but her old path is gone. Perhaps that's why she turns for home makes a list of everything she shifted since he died, imagines him coming back to the tidy house, new doorbell, missing folders, mended light. Would she run from room to room like an excited child, showing what she's rearranged or apologize? She waits for his car headlights, shadow on the steps, key in the door, she waits for his ghost, though she's not sure she believes in ghosts, waits at least to dream of him alive, but nothing comes. She chips a tooth, the car breaks down, the cats bring a dead wood pigeon in, the cellar floor is soaked, invoices fall through the door, she watches the news, half the world underwater, the rest in flame. She dreams of strangers talking to her, but she can't hear what they say. Dreams of shrouded cityscapes and faces lost in fog. Dreams she's almost blind and swimming in a fractured pool in the bowels of an abandoned building. Broken windows, rusted pipes. She's flailing, breaststroke weak, can't see a thing. But somehow, somehow she doesn't drown. She wakes. That was uh, amazing, really. It's so moving and powerful and yet so kind of delicate. And um, thank you, Amanda, really. Extraordinary reading, and um, we're, we're going to have a couple of questions, uh, if that's okay with you, and you'll want to get your emotional breath back, I think, probably, so I hope we'll have a question for Kim first, I'm hoping Kim's going to join us, and... Um, come on, more. get ready. <laughs> the one that's come, the, the only one that's come in, is uh, how long did it take each of you to do this and was it a continuous project thing or so answer but as you like I suppose Kim um I think I, I started writing the essay version in lockdown in that very first lockdown when um everything was cancelled and we all had to stay in our houses and although I had no childcare. Uh, my husband also had no work so we came to an agreement that he would just look after the baby and I could write for the first time instead of <clears> running <throat> around doing everything else 
and but I couldn't write I just found I couldn't write poetry because I'd just finished the poetry collection so um uh, so I think it was like being stuck in the house and being stuck in the house with my trumpet so I didn't really explain before that I just started writing because I've had this weird haunted relationship with the trumpet my whole life that I, I played it and was obsessed with it for years and years and then started getting performance anxiety and stopped stopped playing for about 10 years um and one day I just and I never I, ne I wrote about it a little bit but more about teaching the trumpet in poetry and I've never really kind of tackled those very difficult sometimes painful feelings that I have about it so I thought right I'm just gonna start writing so that was like the first lockdown I don't know when it is it's all blowing into it was that a couple, two years ago wasn't it and then um and then I don't know when I sent it sent it to you um but it, it became relatively much quicker than a poetry collection which takes me six years <laughs> um I feel like I could just dribble on in prose forever but I was thinking Amanda when you were reading that we were working on these books at the same time weren't we because we were sending extracts to each other and it's interesting that um they're both kind of broken out of the container of a small lyric poem which I think we were both writing before and it's they both kind of expanded into into something else absolutely yeah no that's true absolutely I I, I wrote these very very fast and I write really really slowly or not at all a lot of the time um I I mean, actually, Peter didn't quite say this. Uh, I I took part. I'd been not writing for ages. It's a long time since my second collection came out. And one of the ways I was trying to kickstart myself back into it, it was partly a, Kim, a group that Kim started, actually, a group of us friends who were sending stuff to each other was very helpful to me because I didn't have anything to send. But also I I took part in a an advanced poetry course that um, Peter and Anne run the poetry business and one of the things we we were going to do over the summer was to write a long poem about something or other and and I thought I was going to write along with a few other people in the group about water um and I actually started writing about water um and then my partner was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died seven weeks later so that sounds very glib the way I've just said that but that's it wasn't glib, obviously, but it sort of I carried on writing. And so in a, in a way, it was it's it, I, I was writing these two separate things. I was writing from a dream. I was writing from a, 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 a thing about something to do with me almost in a premonition kind of way, feeling something ominous happening before it happened. And then I was also literally writing as I was sitting through the night waiting for the district nurses to come that was kind of very straightforwardly autobiographical. And so there were these two things going on and I sent them to, I, I sent them and I don't know what I'm doing. And I, I don't know whether I, these two poems, is this one poem? Have I written one poem twice? Have I repeated myself completely? Is this, am I, have I lost my mind? Quite possibly, yes. Um, and that's kind of how they happened. It's not, I've never written in that way before and I probably won't again. So it was, it was fast for me. In, relatively speaking, it, these are not things that I've reworked extensively at all. So, We're very conscious, Anne and myself, what a privilege it is, actually, Amanda. And Kim, what a joy it was to work on your work with you on the book. Did, well, work, we didn't do anything. You just waited for you to say more. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. Both of you, really, um, so different, and yet, you know, um, a wonderful thing for us, is what I'm saying. Uh, there is one more question that's coming from Lydia Kenaway, and I'm wondering if we could adapt it for you. Um, it's to Kim asking about, does reading music affect the way you write poetry? Thinking of musical notation as a kind of pitch against time graph. Wondering if this influences the way you see words on the page. And I wondered, uh, Amanda, about being a playwright, does that affect the way that you wrote this? So- Who's going first? Go Kim, go Kim. Well, can okay. I just, Amanda can also answer it as a musician because I found out the other day she plays the piano, which she's kept that very quiet. Um, Claire dobbed you in. Claire Shaw dobbed you uh -huh. in. Um, so she can answer this question as a as a musician as well. Um, I think it affects the yeah. I think it does affect the way that I write because I think all of the line breaks for poetry are that I are, that I put in my poems. I see them as phrases, and it's you know I see the poem 
as I've written it down, like a musical score. That's why I want people to breathe when they're reading. Um, so yeah, it does it does affect it in that way. But um, I'm not sure about the um, about the prose book whether it's affected it. I think it affects the way I perform as well. Um, because um, I did a performance of this book a couple of days ago with some musicians, um, and my twin sister played for me and. I got her to read some of the books so that I could get ready to play a trumpet bit. And I was saying to her, can you read, can you, can you, can you think of that sentence as like a, a musical phrase? So you're aiming for this word and then you're coming away. And she was like, can't I just read it? <laughs> and I didn't realize like it was that moment, like listening to her read because, you know, she sounds very similar to, we have exactly the same accent. That made me really realize the kind of music that I see in a sentence, um, which I've not thought about too much before. I, I think I think your I think your work is always really influenced by you being a musician, and and I I think that's probably true of me too. And in the sense, I think I've always had a very I've always found the a sort of quite a subtle thing, but a rhythm thing quite important. Because mm -hmm. um, I I I was doing music long before I was doing poetry, if you like, and I it was that way around. I think as well, Peter, the thing you asked about playwriting, I, I think I, when I started writing poetry, I realised quite early on I was writing narrative poetry rather than sort of lyric moment on the moment poetry. I was writing stories. Um, and I, so the poetry came first and the poetry would also come last. The poetry is it. The po you know, if I, had to, if, if I had to take poems or plays onto from my burning house, it would always be poems. You know, po poetry is the most important thing to me. Um, but I think I always had that thing of being really interested in story. And I think as I've written plays now and got more into that world as well, I think that there is an interesting crossover for me, not interesting for anybody else, um, but for me and the way I write, that there is that thing of how story works, I think, and what is the arc of the narrative if you're writing a narrative, if I'm writing a narrative poem, what's the shape of it? And I think I think like that a lot. And that's to do with that's definitely to do with writing drama as much as it's to do with music, I think. Yeah. yeah. These are good questions, aren't they? And, and just as good answers, I have to say. Um, and a, a comment has come in from Jeff Tansey. Uh, I, I'm sure she's, he's not the only one. He said that your reading, Amanda, brought tears to his eyes and, um, you know, it's, it's really moving. He does also say uh, it, it, it didn't bring tears to his eyes to hear yours, Kim, but he did love the reading. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> and uh, I, Kim, you, you weren't playing the trumpet, but you are now. Is that right? You yeah, so... Yeah, I stopped playing for properly for about eight, eight or 10 years, but I was still, I wasn't playing like, so I stopped playing semi-professionally, but I was still playing because I was teaching in school. So I was playing like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Jingle Bells. Um, and then I did, I was playing in a soul band, but not practicing. So I was basically like blagging my way through every gig and just kind of hanging on for grim death. Um, so not practicing at all. And then I started writing this book and one day I looked over at my trumpet and thought, I feel like practicing. And that was the first time in probably 15, maybe even 20 years that I've, that I felt that feeling again. And it was like writing the book reminded me of how much I loved, I used to love, love the trumpet. So I think, um, I think writing for me is, you know, I've always thought poetry is transformation and it can change me and it can change the world and it can change people. But I didn't realise that it was writing as well. Like the write, writing this book made me remember why I loved trumpet playing. And it's completely changed my relationship with it as well. So I'm performing semi-professionally again. I'm still suffering from performance anxiety, but I'm kind of trying to work through it. And um, I've been practising differently. And so I'm seeing it more as like a creative experiment. So it's kind of opened up what I think of, what I think creative practice is rather than just kind of narrowly writing poetry. I'm thinking, oh, it can be, I don't have to compartmentalise everything to keep it all under control like I was before. I'm just, you know, like I did half, I was really stressed earlier. So I did half an hour, what I call stress practice, which is where you just blast through a concerto and like, 
you know exhaust yourself and then you know it doesn't doesn't do anything but um yeah so yeah I'm playing again now is the short answer yeah uh, that's a wonderful bonus really isn't it uh, for the book I, you know it's great obviously that you've done the book but it's really nice that you've it's brought you back to the trumpet properly I know that you're playing in your soul band which it's got a great name yeah the soul survivors but I didn't write the book for that I wrote the book I was thinking I'm going to just put this to bed now I'm going to say I, I felt the book was like a last goodbye to the trumpet and I thought I'm just going to put it away because I don't teach anymore and I thought I'm just going to write the book get it out of my system and then I can just move on from this this thing that's that has haunted me and instead it's had the complete opposite effect and Kim I don't know if you know this yet but you are we're about there's about to be a new band that you're in obviously so Claire Shaw and you and I are about to form a very interesting trio of trumpet violin and piano it's going to be amazing so watch the space everybody <laughs> yeah I, there's loads of music been written for trumpet violin and piano of course exactly exactly all the great composers have written for that ensemble <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, uh, and Amanda, you, you're, uh, this new book that's not quite on the horizon, but it's, it's heading towards it. Um, do you want to say something about that quickly? And, that, and then I'm hoping that each of you will read uh, a poem finally to bring the, this remarkable evening to a close. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, I'm, uh, it's not too much to say because it really is in, it's in, oh, I don't know, I'm, it's in bits, uh, like me. Um, I think it's called Fantastic Voyage. Fantastic Voyage is a 1966 film in which uh, a, a group of scientists are shrunk uh, and go inside a miniaturised submarine to uh, repair the damage to the brain of a scientist who has the world's secrets to some... It, it's a, a fantastic kind of bonkers sci-fi adventure with a Cold War twist. Um, but it also feels to me like a rather wonderful title to explore many things really, um, including voyages inside the body. So I think that Notes on Water may well appear in the book, but it's really very much a book about uh, voyages in different ways, really. So, yeah, it's there's a long way to go yet with the writing of it. I've got lots of I've got I'm at that stage where there's stuff and it's all it hasn't quite coalesced yet. And uh, it, it, it'll happen in its own good time, but it's on its way. I'm just very slow generally with poems and I've just resigned myself to that. And I think that's kind of okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not a factor. Yeah. Oh, it's been a really great evening, uh, both of you. And uh, on behalf of Anne and myself, because we feel so close to both of you in this way, but also the rest of the team, I know that how much um, everybody at the Poetry Business has been excited by doing these books. And particularly Katie, who the designer and um, who's done all the work, really, the typesetting and, and working with um, Emma and putting it. To the, they're really lovely collections. If you'd not heard them, um, you'd, you'd want to buy them just because they look nice. And so if you, if you take the subtext from that and go to our Poetry Business website, uh, if you want to um, do that, or you can probably, there's a link, I expect, somewhere for you to buy the books. Um, great. So, uh, is it Kim again? Are you, you you're reading first. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna. If anyone's following along on the PDF, I'm gonna read page one hundred and fifteen. I'm uh, gonna bow, bow out now, guys. So thank you very much. So it's been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and I would echo what Peter said about Katie. She's amazing and very patient. Um, isn't she Amanda <laughs> very patient yeah having to deal with me but um there's the there's the cover which has these lovely trumpets and there's the a painting by Emma Burley in the, in the anyway so I'm gonna I'm gonna um so I mentioned that I so I went to music college and then I um became a eventually became a trumpet teacher for Cumbria Music Service and I was traveling around doing about 25 schools a week um, teaching lots of different brass instruments and again um, seeing as Peter said I'm going to read a poem at the end I will read the one that is inhabiting or stealing threads from poetry land I think it is um, and it's about that experience of um, 
being a, a, a music teacher and then starting it this is from around the time when I was starting to write and starting to think I can't be a music teacher forever I need to do, I need to find time for this for writing <clears throat> Sometimes I arrive at school and the children are out on a trip or rehearsing for a play or doing extra maths, extra PE, a knitting lesson. They're out at forest schools, they're changing their library book or waiting to see the head teacher. They're in an important assembly or helping the caretaker. They've forgotten their instruments or they've forgotten their mouthpieces. The teacher has to listen to them read or they have to finish their handwriting practice or they're still eating their lunch or the dinner ladies have them lined up against the wall for bad behavior or they have, they have to tidy up the paints. And sometimes the receptionist forgets to tell me any of this. And I sit in the classroom and wait for 10 minutes before going to try and find the missing children, searching down corridors and knocking on classroom doors. The teacher looking relieved or irritated or happy at the interruption. And sometimes the receptionist will remember to tell me as I walk through the door before I even sign in. And at some schools, the receptionist will ring me as I pull up in the car park before I unload the bag of music books, the spare trumpet, the spare baritone, the spare mouthpieces, my trumpet, my laptop. Sometimes they ring as I'm sat there, willing myself to get out of my car and they tell me I'm not needed. And it's these receptionists that I am most grateful for. And I say, oh, what a shame. And oh, well, there's always next week. And I get back into my car and pull out my pen and notebook and wind all the windows up. And I put the heater on full blast, no matter the temperature outside. And I begin, of course, I begin to write. Thank oh, you. That's fabulous. That's a great one to finish on, Kim. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. I'm just going to read a poem that uh, I've obviously I've, I've I've read the whole of Notes on Water, um, but just to finish, I'm just going to read a a single poem uh, that's quite new-ish, and it's called "The Possibility of Fog." If this long familiar road can turn to cataract. My friend become invisible though he stands at my side. If the heifer can die from grazing air and water as she stumbles to the barn. If in a moment everything can muffle, everything murmur and cling like apparitions in the night though it's only 2 p.m. If I can be so suddenly and spectacularly lost in the place I was born lost before there's even time to watch the bowl of the valley fill with floss, delicate muslin turning like those useless curtains we used to wrap around ourselves when we were young and drunk. If cloud can fall to the ground, then rise again, and there's the old oak that was gone, and the meadow grass, and a spider's web, and the road all glittered with frost, and my friend is beside me laughing, and someone has turned the volume up, and there's even a curlew in the clear, bright air. If this is possible, then maybe everything is possible. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kim. <laughs>